Okay. So, time to get ready. So everyone had pizza? I'm guessing people are feeling a little bit sort of tired and blah at this sort of stage. So, I'll try and stay reasonably awake, even though I'm kind of half asleep a little bit myself. So, can I... Interesting question I often get asked. So I end up going in helping organizations to build financial systems that need to go particularly fast, particularly doing high frequency trading at times. And this question often gets posed to me. So to say, really, what is your favorite language for doing this in? Because I'll write code in C, I'll write stuff in C. Java, even JavaScript, and C Sharp, and other languages. And people ask, well, which one would you really choose? They're kind of expecting maybe C to be the answer. But whenever I respond saying Java is my preferred language, people kind of act a bit funny at this stage. And it's very often followed up by this question. It's like, why? Why would you want to build a low latency application on a garbage collected platform? Because we know the garbage collection becomes a really big issue. And at this stage, there's usually some C++ programmers in the room, and they kind of act a little bit like this at this stage. They sort of look at me and think, oh, you must be totally stupid. <laughs> why do you do these sorts of things? So let's kind of explore this a little bit. So what I'm going to cover here, I want to set some context initially sort of like to give an idea for why we're talking about this subject. Then we're going to go in and explore a little bit about what our managed runtimes can do for us. So this will be sort of things that the compilers can do, but I also want to look at garbage collection because it's kind of the elephant in the room about this, and then finish up with some algorithms and design. Because when I'm talking about managed runtimes, I'm talking about Java, sort of that's pretty obvious here, but also sort of like C Sharp, JavaScript, there's lots of other managed runtimes out there, and they're just some very interesting things. So let's start off with some context to begin with. So just up front, let's be clear that a managed runtime isn't always a good choice. There are many cases, and I'll come around to some of them later, but the kind of classic one in finance is latency arbitrage. And this is where you're trying to be the absolute fastest in a market, and if you're going to be the fastest in a market, what approach do you take? How do you do that? Well, it's actually not even a debate about languages these days. If you want to be the absolute fastest, you tend to be doing this in hardware. FPGAs? sort of programming the hardware that runs in the network switches themselves. You would not be writing C even to do this. So when you start talking about this, this is a different extreme. I want to sort of wind back and say, so if I'm writing code that will run in a language, what language will I choose? Why will I choose it? What are the pros and cons of this? So the kind of other obvious question up front is, are native languages faster than languages run on managed runtimes? And there's a, quite a simple answer to that, and it's like basically, yes, if you have infinite time, you've got access to infinite skills, and you have infinite resources to do stuff. But who on a project can say they have infinite time? Whoever works on a project, you think you have too much time. That's never really the case. You have too much time. Wow, <laughs> I want to work on some of your projects. <laughs> so like, if I'm writing two algorithms, I'm writing one in Java, one in C++, I can probably make the C++ one run faster, but it takes me a lot longer to get to that point. Also, getting access to people who know how to make things go at the sort of more ends, the extreme ends of performance is an interesting challenge in its own right. But let's wind back and let's look at what actually goes on in modern programming. And I want to particularly look at programs that are particularly CPU and memory intensive. If you're going to network or you're going to disk, it's a different set of problems. And actually, the language doesn't come into it so much at that point. But let's focus on the language issues, because that's interesting, and particularly CPU and memory performance. So kind of quick question. How long does it take to add two integers on a modern Intel CPU? Any ideas? One cycle? Yep. We've got some people who've done their homework here. So yeah, one cycle, less than one nanosecond. That's if you've got two integers, they're in, two registers are ready, you do an addition, you get a result. It only takes one cycle. And actually, many instructions only take one cycle. There's some instructions take longer, like divide operation and some memory operations that are a longer thing. But it actually doesn't take very long to do this. So, 
let's make it a bit more interesting. How about if we're going to add up all of the elements in an array of integers? I want to sum them all up, and what is the average time per operation for doing this? So how long will that take? And so I'm going to write a microbenchmark. I'm going to do this and see how long it takes. So if I go through the array sequentially and I add everything up, we find that it actually takes less than one nanosecond per element. So if we sort of do it over them all, and we divide it by the number of things the total time is taken, it's less than a nanosecond. Like, that seems really very short. Because if you think about this, like really less than a nanosecond? To do the operations, you've got to like go through the array. You've got to load the next element. You've got to load it into a register. You've got to then sum it to the previous value. And then you've got to keep that, and then you've got to increment on to the next thing. So there's multiple steps even per element that you're dealing with. Well, how can we go so fast on a modern CPU? Well, our current Intel CPUs within a single core have many execution units. So not just one. On a Haswell CPU, we have eight ports with many execution units attached to those. And those things can be happening in parallel on the same thread. So the increment of the loop counter, as well as the increment of the summation that you're doing across the array, can actually be happening at the same time without you even writing parallel code. These things happen in our modern CPUs. And in fact, it's going on to load the next instruction. So, so that they can do a lot at any given point in time. But let's make it a bit more interesting. What if the pattern of access is different? So, that example I've given is I want to run through the whole array and I'm going to sum everything up by going through it sequentially in order. How about some other patterns of access to the array? So I'm going to do the same amount of work, but I'm going to access the array using different patterns. And let's look at some of those different patterns. Well, the first case was our sequential pattern. The second case here is let's go randomly within an operating system page, so randomly within a 4K space and add everything up, and then go on to the next 4K page and add everything up again and continue that over the whole one gigabyte array. Third case is, let's do that again. So we're going to do it randomly, but we won't do the next increment until we've worked out the value of the previous one. So the value of the previous one must feed into where the next random step happens to be. That takes a bit longer. Then let's go randomly across the whole array adding things up. And then finally, let's go randomly across the whole array whereby we're feeding in the previous value into what we're doing. So we're seeing there's a big difference here. So sequentially through the whole array versus randomly where you're dependent upon the last value. And we're doing the same amount of work in every case. It's just the pattern of access is different. We go from being less than one nanosecond. This is on a 2.4 gigahertz CPU up to nearly 90 nanoseconds. So two orders of magnitude difference. Same work, different pattern of access. So what starts to see is the ways we access our data really matters. And that's because of how our memory subsystem works. Like we talk about random access memory. It's a terrible name for it. First of all, it isn't random. It's arbitrary. Like, would you want to go to memory and it just give you any random value it found? We're kind of bad when we name things in computer science. We really should pick up a dictionary before we put a name on things. It's one of my pet peeves about our subject. Like, software maintenance is another good one. Do we need to oil software? Does it need greased? Does it wear out? No, it doesn't. We use the wrong metaphors and examples, but it's kind of coming back to this. So we've got these different patterns. I'll talk to them a little bit about what's involved, but particularly the really interesting thing is if you have a dependency on the last value. So when you're working at the next random step, if you needed the previous value, you can't go forward. We talk about this as data-dependent loads. You'll also have heard about it as pointer chasing. And so when you look at those examples, the fact that it takes one cycle to do an arithmetic operation, but it takes maybe up to 100 nanoseconds to do a memory operation, you start to realize that the operations that we do that are like mathematical are effectively free. The memory operations is where all the cost happens to be. So if we can manage those, that becomes really interesting. And what's kind of interesting is the cases where we create pointer chasing. 
I love this little expression. Sort of, we were looking at things where all is a riddle, and the key to the riddle is another riddle. So you can't do the next step till you get the previous step. So much of our code is a riddle to the processor. It can't make progress till it's worked out the previous one. Maybe that's a function of our industry. Like, a lot of code that I've read in my career is a riddle. We seem to write code that is so hard to understand, not just for our processor, but for our fellow human beings. We should maybe get a bit better at doing this. So let's look at how do we address some of these issues. So kind of quick primer on performance 101 when we start thinking about memory. Memory is transported in cache lines within our cache subsystem. So it's broken up into 64-byte chunks, and those are the units of things that we move around. Now, why is that a good thing when we look at our design? Well, if you think of an object, we've got fields in our objects. So let's say I've got a person class, and that person has a date of birth, and they've got a favorite color, and they've got a job, and all those sorts of things. Those fields, if they're together, they're likely to be in the same cache line. So modeling your code well, good object-oriented modeling is actually a good way to get very good performance out of your code. So think about keep things together that should be together. It's also managed in operating system pages. So the, the difference, because we had this performance difference between going randomly within a page and going randomly over the whole heap, is we deal with virtual addresses. Those virtual addresses have to be turned in physical addresses for our memory, and we've got a small cache that does that lookup called the translation look aside buffer. So if you stay within the same operating system page, it is faster. And one of the reasons why it takes so long to sort of deal with stuff where you're dependent on the last value, if we want to look up separate memory addresses, our cache subsystems can track 10 concurrent cache misses. So they can go look for 10 different things at the same time, and the cost gets amortized as the results come back if you don't have a dependency, because if you need the value of this one before you get the next one, you can't go ahead concurrently. You're limited in this. And the kind of last thing our memory subsystem does for us is it will prefetch our memory if we have predictable access patterns. So in the example of let's go linearly through the whole array, it's a very predictable pattern. It can fetch the memory before you actually need it in the background. Whereas if you're going completely random, it's got no way of predicting what your code's doing. So being predictable in your code is a great way to get performance. Can our runtimes help us with some of this? Let's explore this. So runtime optimization. We've got code. We want it to run fast. We want our compilers to help us out. And compilers will do a lot to try and make our code faster. Our managed runtimes have got a nice thing that they can do is they can use profile guided optimization. So based upon real usage and real data patterns, they can apply specific optimizations. Our static compilers can do some of this. If we do a build that's got profiling information, that we capture that, and then we do another compilation based upon that captured information, very few people do that sort of thing because it's so difficult to get a good example of what your live application is going to be. And actually, if things change, then you've got issues. Whereas our managed runtimes can take bets, they can get things wrong, and they can do it again. They can revoke things and go back again. Well, let's look at some examples on this. So our code is usually full of branches, loads of ifs, whiles, fors, case statements, switches, all of that sort of stuff. And here I've got a method foo. I've got some code at the top of it. I've got a condition in the middle of it with some code inside it. And then I've got some code at the bottom. We would like to go through everything sequentially to give us that good pattern of access because your code is just in memory the same as your data is just in memory. So we want it to be fast. We want a predictable access pattern. So we end up with a block of code here. We then hit the condition. Now, do I go into this branch or not go into this branch? If you were to go into the branch, that's fine. You'd follow straight through, and then you do the end of it. But what if this branch is very seldom ever taken? It's a check for something being bad, and it generally never happens. You end up with the problem of you now have to jump over block A to block C, and you'll be 
always having to do that jump. It's not a predictable pattern. We have branch predictors that can help us a bit with this, but we may want it to be that block B is very infrequent. I would like to have block C right at the end of block A. And we could do that by laying it out like this. And then we could lay out the memory so that block B is somewhere else. Maybe not even compiled. It could be inside the interpreter. Based upon what we're seeing from profile-guided optimization in a runtime, they can compile code and do this sort of thing. It can lay it out like that. Now, in our static languages, we can hint and provide hints to the compiler that this branch is likely to be taken, not likely to be taken. It's difficult to get all of that right. Even in things like an operating system, the Linux kernel had lots of hints saying certain things would be prefetched, certain things would be branch predicted a certain way, and quite often those were wrong, and they've had to be all removed, so it's really difficult to get this right. It's kind of nice to do it based upon real data. That's one example, but branches can be even more subtle than you think. It could be a simple ternary expression. If i is greater than 7, I'll use the value a, otherwise I'll use the value b. Now, if you find that i is pretty much always greater than 7, like 95% or greater, the branch predictor will do quite well and pick the right thing. But if it's 50-50, it's really hard to do that. The branch predictor isn't going to help you. It's going to get it wrong as often as it gets it right, and that's got a cost. Well, XCD6 has got an instruction called CMove that will let you address this. We do a conditional move without a branch. We can choose to use that based upon profile guided optimization. Our runtime can go do that for us. Things like Java does this out of the box. So again, we don't even need to know about this. We just write our code and the right thing happens. Methods. We often have methods calling other methods or functions calling other functions, like foo will call a bar at this stage. So I've got a block of code that's going to run at the top. I'm going to hit bar. I'm going to have to jump out to somewhere else in memory, execute bar, jump back again, and then execute the code below. Again, unpredictable patterns of access to this. Could we do something different? Well, if this code is hot and used a lot, what we can do is we can do block A. We could choose to inline bar directly into the method foo, not even take the function call and have it go completely sequentially on the end of it, and then follow it with block B. You don't want to do this everywhere because a thing called iCache will be overrun, so you've got a very small instruction cache, and you can get code bloat. So choosing where you do this, where you don't do it, starts to really matter. A runtime can measure and work out where to do that. Static compiler is going to struggle a lot more with that. You can hint, but all your hints are always going to be right. So Cliff Click, who wrote uh, the C2 compiler for Hotspot, one of my discussions I had with him over a beer, he talked about how inlining is the optimization, but choosing when to do it is really important, and you can only really do that well based upon a good profile of live code with real data. So you can't just always get this right in advance. And it can feed into other things. So for example, loops. We spend over 80% of the time in our code in loops somewhere. We're looping all the time. What can we do to optimize loops? Well, we can do things like unrolling. So rather than looping one at a time, we can sort of do four per iteration. That cuts down the amount of work. It also makes it more sequential through memory without lots of jump statements. But do we want to do this everywhere? We only want to do it where it's going to benefit. So we need the measurement from the live system to know where that's going to be. And we might even find other interesting things, like particular methods in there may have the ability to be done with special instructions. So for example, integer.bit count, there is a CPU instruction on x86 called pop count, which will do that in a single instruction. Whereas doing a bit count takes a lot of masking and shifting if you don't have that instruction. We can see, does this processor support this? If it does, emit that as well. Really nice things that our compilers can spit out. Whereas if we were doing this with a static language, we have to target a platform, often the lowest common denominator, and we don't find these things so easy. Polymorphism. We use it a lot with video and object orientation. So let's say I have an array of shapes. I want to draw them all out. 
So I'm going to go through, I'm going to iterate over that array, I'm going to call draw on them. There could be many different types of shapes. There may only be one type of shape. We will have to, in a static language, do a virtual dispatch at this stage. So if this was C++, we have to go to a V table and jump off to the code and a different jump for every different type in here. But what if there's only one type? What if we've only got circles? or we've only got polygons, we don't use squares or rectangles or some other type of things, we can optimize in our code at the call site, and we can say in Java, this call site, I only use circles, so I'm not gonna use a jump table, I'm gonna use an optimization where this is monomorphic dispatch. I might even inline that method at that stage based upon real runtime data. And it's call site specific, so you've got a different call site somewhere else, you may choose to inline one and do monomorphic, another one, you may not because there's many other types. How do you know how many types you've got, especially in a dynamic language like Java, where you can do dynamic class loading and stuff? Well, the thing is, you can take the bet that there only is one at any given point in time. Later on, another one's loaded, and this is where a nice thing comes in called class hierarchy analysis. So the class loader will track how many types of something has been loaded, and when you load a new one, if you have monomorphic call sites, you can then choose to de-optimize that, but you can do that based upon runtime analysis. Or take the example of the shapes. What if polygons are far more common than circles? We can choose that we'll do an inline cache of the code for polygon and jump out for circles when we occasionally see them. Again, all based upon runtime, based upon real data. So, kind of quick summary on that section is we can have a profile that will guide our optimizations based upon real data for our real code. And these bets can be taken, and the nice thing is if you get it wrong, you can revoke it and go back again. It's agile in how you approach the code problem, whereas static means you've got to know everything up front. It's actually better to know later based upon what we're actually seeing. Garbage collection. So that was the big elephant in the room that people always worry about when it comes to things like low latency. A couple of points on garbage collection first up. So to steal from Billy Joel here, only the good die young. If you want to get the best out of your garbage collector, make sure your objects live for the shortest possible time. This plays to a concept called the weak generational, or the weak generational hypothesis, where things will be garbage collected sooner and cheaper if they don't live so long. So I want to dig into this. Let's see what happens inside our garbage collectors. So the generational garbage collectors, they'll have to do more work depending on how long an object lives. So it organizes it in a way where we deal with the, the young generation differently than we deal with the old generation. And I'm going to go into this in a little bit of detail. But before I do, let's go back to looking at how our modern servers are put together. So we'll typically have a pizza box somewhere in a rack that has got two CPU sockets. Each of them have got their own memory connected to them. Within each socket, we have multiple cores. If you're accessing memory in the local caches, you'll see that it's much faster than accessing the shared caches or going to the other machine or to main memory. So if you're looking at this, this picture, if your thread is running on the left-hand side, but it's dealing with memory at the right-hand side, it's having to cross this interconnect in the middle called QPI, the quick path interface. It adds another 40 nanoseconds to your memory access time crossing this link. So you want things to be local. How do you know what's local and stuff? So you've effectively got a distributed system problem here inside your own box. But it gets worse than that these patterns are repeating. So if you go to one of the leaders, Broadwell EX uh, Xeon chips, and you've got greater than 10 cores, even within the same socket, you now have multiple rings with network switches between them. Those little gray boxes in the middle at the top and bottom are what's known as the S-box switch, and it can work as a switch or a hub exactly the same as a network works. And you start thinking, you're not doing distributed systems. Everything is distributed systems these days. It's all fractal. And being aware that the different access patterns make a big difference to this. So what can we do 
from a managed runtime perspective to give us benefits in these sorts of scenarios. So if we're looking at the young generation, when we allocate an object, we allocate from what's known as a, th a thread local allocation buffer. The, the T-labs that are talked about, each thread has got its own T-lab, and because you've got your own one, there's no concurrency involved, you just move along a pointer to say, this is the space for the next object. It's very cheap to allocate at this stage. If it fits inside the T-lab, you're good. If it doesn't fit, you need to take other steps in this. So we get nice scalability. Threads are individual at this stage. In fact, we've even got NUMA awareness. So those multiple sockets with the separate memory regions, they've got the interesting property of if you can stay within your local memory region, you have got faster access. Now, if you're running the parallel old GC, one of the options you have with Java is to use the NUMA use NUMA flag, and it will allocate T-labs local to your socket and give you better performance. Unfortunately, if you're using CMS or G1, we don't have some of those options. So it'd be nice to have them available across all of our collectors. And so we get these nice properties that we end up dealing with here. But objects survive. And if they survive for a while, like again, this is another good example of misnaming. We don't do garbage collection. We do object harvesting, really. We do the work on keeping objects that are still alive, the objects that are no longer referenced, we just forget about, so we don't collect any garbage at all. But So if we want to keep objects, what we do is we work out which objects are still referenced from the older generation by pointers back to the young generation, and those ones that are still referenced, we've got to keep them, and we copy them to the survivor spaces. So, we do a, a young generation collection, we copy them to the survivor spaces, and we copy to and from until they've aged for a while. So the longer you keep an object around, the more work is involved because it's copied to and from each of these survivor spaces. And there's some interesting things to consider at this point. So there's the aging policies. The fact that we can compact as we copy is a really useful thing, and I'll come back to that. It works nice for parallel algorithms, and the important thing is only the survivors actually involve any work. So if the, your objects are good, they die young, and they don't have much cost to that. If they live longer, then the, the aging policy of being copied from one survivor space to another survivor space, they end up being copied to the old generation or the tenured space at this stage. There's some interesting things that can happen at this point. So, for example, the new G1 collector can deal with string deduplication. So, if we have the same string in multiple places in our code, as we go through the garbage collection stage, we can actually get it to deduplicate and only have one copy of that, of the underlying character. This can be turned on, it's not on by default. And we have some options to do concurrent garbage collection in the old generation with many of our collectors that are out there, so we don't end up pausing. But let's get back to the compacting stuff. So let's say this is the young generation, and after a while we need to do a garbage collection, and these blocks are the objects that are still remaining. Now, that could be a case of we have a rather large array, and that array is pointing to a number of other objects, so we're going to retain those. The garbage collector does what's known as a depth first copy. So, what it'll do is it'll copy all of those children of the collection and compact them all nicely together. It will then copy the array itself and let's move to probably the survivor space or to the old space, whatever it happens to be at this stage. But think about now we've got all our objects together. So they're within cache lines, they're within operating system pages that are close together. We can actually get performance from our garbage collector. So the garbage collector isn't something that just costs us. It gives benefits as well. It can actually help organize our memory. But the nasty thing with most of this is anytime we're doing a compaction, we end up with a stop the world event. The way most of our garbage collectors are written, if we go to compact, we stop everything because when we move stuff, we've got to fix all the references that point to those objects because those references will be pointing to where the object was, not where it now is. So that all has to be patched up and fixed. So to address that, our garbage collectors tend to stop 
and then they go and uh, restart things after they've done all the copying and all the fix-up of the references at this stage. So what are we doing to try and improve some of this? Well, things like G1 is now splitting up the heap into lots of different regions, and it's called G1 because it looks at the regions which has the most amount of garbage, the least amount of objects that are retained, and copies those, but it does it with a smaller chunk so the pause doesn't have to be as long. It is still pausing, but it's pausing for last time as it deals with individual regions, so it splits it up and gives us a more responsive application. There's better options out there. So things like the Azul C4 collector, it's concurrently compacting, and it can do this on the young and the old generation completely concurrently with your code. So if you want to have no pauses, we have the options of some collectors to do this. And this is usually where, when you're looking at the C++ folks saying, like, are you crazy? Well, you can address this even in allocating applications by using collectors like this that, that are available. But that's actually just the boring stuff that we've been kind of doing right from the small talk days. Where can garbage collectors go? And what's current experimental research in this? And one of the really interesting areas is the ability to inline or aggregate objects together. So you go back to that person example I said before. And if I'm a person and I've got a favorite color and I've got a date of birth and I've got some other things, what if I grouped those objects together and kept them together and moved them as a chunk, always with the same known predictable offsets? That could give us much, much better performance. We now are getting the ability to add these sorts of features into our VMs. I've seen experimental work on this where it's successful. Now, we could program it ourselves, so it would be nice to be able to hint this to the JVM and do it, and there is proposals for doing that, but none of them have made any significant progress. If you're writing C or C++ or even C Sharp, we have the ability to specify the layout and control this much better. Java is kind of lacking a little bit in this area, but there's lots of really good performance improvements that can come here. But let's go back to comparing GC versus memory management if you're going to do it manually, because it's not that easy to pick a clear winner. Like, everybody talks about allocation is cheap. Allocation is cheap pretty much in all forms. It's the reclamation, the collecting later is where the real costs come. And that's not just in a managed runtime. If you're doing an alloc and a free, or a new and a delete in C++, it is very expensive to do that collection, particularly when you hand across threads. So what are the things you've got to worry about in the managed runtime? Well, choosing your GC implementation makes a big difference. There are wildly different implementations out there with implications to how they work. Some are quite low on pauses. Some have quite a high overhead, and the quality of a lot of the implementations is interesting. So one of the examples being a thing called card marking. So when we go to collect, we have to work out which regions of the heap do we need to search to find is there references back to objects in the young generation. We don't want to search that entire heap. So we use these techniques called card marking to make it easier to work out which regions we've got to search. But keeping those data structures has a cost. And they also have issues where you can end up with sharing that you're not even aware of on those data structures. The reads and writes of fields have barriers associated with them, so you actually know stuff's happening. So if you set a reference on an object, it's not as simple as just setting the reference. You'll end up doing some card marking, you'll be updating some data structures for the garbage collector, and sometimes they're quite significant. Like I see people moving to the G1 garbage collector, and their overall throughput drop quite significantly because of some of the overhead of these data structures and the things like the object headers that come with a lot of this. But on the native side, it's not all that good, too. Different Moloch implication, uh, implementations have different values, different strengths. They can be arena-based, they can be pool-based, they can have bin wastage. There's all sorts of interesting issues that exist around there. But also, primarily, thinking of the debugging effort that comes with dealing with manual memory management. I spent a lot of time chasing down bugs where something's been double-freed or had other issues. But the big standout thing with man managing your memory in a manual sense is when you hand things off between threads, it gets a lot more expensive in C or C++. And sometimes in the Java world, it's much easier, much cheaper to use 
GC than it is to manage memory across threads in other ways. So kind of coming on to the more interesting section here is algorithms and design. If you think about this, what is the most important thing to achieving good performance? Anyone got any ideas? What is the most important thing you need to have good performance in an application? You, you want to have adequate performance for your application for whatever its need is. The need may be to be the fastest in the world, but it also may just be you don't piss off your customers. So what do you need before anything else? Benchmark. You're kind of searching for tools. I would argue that the thing you need most is time. You need time to be able to do it and do it well. And that's often the most precious resource on most projects, so is getting the time to do it. I love this quote. If I had had more time, I'd have written a shorter letter. I think this so applies to code as much as any other form of writing. And if you have the time to refine your code and make it smaller and more elegant and cleaner, it will be faster, it'll be easier to understand, it'll be easier to reason about, modify, and deal with it. So time is the big factor that really matters. If you want to look at some of the detail, like you compare the cost of different languages. When you look at any significant project, a lot of these things is where your real time is spent when you start profiling and getting performance issues, it's like finding duplicate work. It doesn't matter if one language is 30% faster than another if you do the work twice. So finding the places where you have duplication, like finding cache misses, looking for contention, all of these sorts of different issues, like choosing the right algorithms and data structures. And one of my personal favorites is API design. API design will limit your performance more than absolutely anything, because it often dictates what an implementation will be inside. So getting that sort of stuff right really matters. And if you're going to have a large code base, trying to do everything well is really, really hard. It takes a long time to get everything done just right. So you have to make trade-offs. You'll choose to spend your time on some things and not on others. And when you start dealing with performance on a large project, it takes some what are uncommon disciplines for many developers, like running profilers often, building telemetry into your code, modeling your system to know whether it's within the performance bounds of what you're expecting. Most people don't even do these things, so you sort of think about what's kind of going on. And a project I've worked on has got a kind of really interesting story to it. So, I've spent the last few years working on a system called Aeron, which is a messaging system. I was asked to write this by an existing client. I was helping them with some concurrent algorithms, and we were talking about how the current messaging systems out there are generally too slow, they're opaque, they're difficult to debug, they're difficult to understand. And so we looked at, well, how would we build a new type of messaging system, particularly one that was transparent, easier to understand, easier to deal with, but it was also fast enough. And we chose to do the first version of it in Java, which surprised a lot of people. So Todd Montgomery and I built this together. We've worked on other messaging systems in the past. Todd's actually built most of the significant ones that are out there. And we're comfortable in C and C++, but we chose Java. And the reason we chose Java is because there's a Time to performance thing that's quite interesting. It's like time to refine algorithms, get to understand a problem, getting to get your head around what is the real thing you're trying to solve rather than what you're actually chasing. And we found that we could iterate our designs and experiment much faster in Java than we could in C. It's easy then to port to other languages afterwards and kind of where you get the performance figures from it. So, at this stage, we've now got it ported to four different languages for the client. So we have the original Java implementation, we've done a C++, there's a Go implementation, and a C Sharp implementation. Now, whenever we wrote the code initially, and we run it, and we actually done the C++ nearly concurrently with the Java one, because it's easy to port the stuff as we go. What was a, quite a big surprise was, to begin with, without any tuning and profiling, the Java version was faster. It was actually faster than the C++. And it was because the runtime was making lots of good optimization decisions on that. 
Now, we were able to make the C++ one faster than the Java, but it took quite a bit of time and effort profiling to do that. But it was interesting that the Java went straight out of the box. C Sharp was a really fascinating one in that it was initially a lot slower than the others. But with just a little bit of profiling, finding out where some of his issues were, it particularly had issues with inlining. We addressed those, and then the C Sharp version was faster than the C++ or the Java version. So the kind of interesting thing I found out of it was Java is one of the best languages to get to quite good performance very quickly, but it gets more difficult to get really great performance beyond the threshold. So it's kind of a fast start, but then it's sort of, you sort of slow down a little bit. Where things like C++ is, it takes you longer to get to the point where you're fast, and then you've got more options, but it's much more work and stuff involved. Now, Aaron's not the only one that's seen this. The C Sharp team themselves discovered this, so they wrote their compiler in C++ rather than C Sharp. And then they decided to dog food the project and have the project implemented in C Sharp for its own compiler. That was the Roslyn compiler. To begin with, it was a little bit painful for the team, but the final result was a new compiler that's much more elegant, much cleaner, and faster than the C++ compiler, because they were able to work on algorithms. And this is where it gets really interesting, is where you spend your time. If you're spending all of your time debugging and dealing with a more complex language, you don't have the time to spend on algorithms. Like, I particularly think about what am I spending my time on? Am I spending my time understanding the underlying machine, like the mechanical sympathy of something, like how the network stack works, how the disk systems works, how processors memory, and having good algorithms that work with them? Or am I spending my whole time debugging pointers that have been sort of broken and I'm trying to chase them down? I would much prefer to be spending my time on the mechanical sympathy issues, and there's bigger wins to be having there. And then if you start looking at things like concurrency, like moving to immutability is a really nice way of dealing with concurrency, and GC really makes this a lot easier. So you've got to kind of think, from an algorithms and the design perspective, you need the time, and you need the time to experiment and analyze your experiments to evolve your design in the right way. You don't come up with the perfect design up front. No one sits down and goes, I know the perfect design, this is all going to work. You have an idea, then there's lots of it you're not going to know. You've got to have the right experiments, you've got to test it, you've got to deal with it. And that's the way you get forward to get really good performance. So, kind of in closing here, what does the future hold? Well, I'm starting to become a sort of old programmer these days, sort of rapidly approaching being 50. And I remember the days of the arguments of assembly versus compilers. I have lots of friends who write games, and I remember when compilers were sort of reaching a threshold where people would argue, you've got to write it in assembler because the compilers aren't fast enough. Now, these days, no one has that discussion anymore. On a large program, the compiler will do a much better job than anybody can do handwriting assembler. Now, you may, for one method or a small number of methods, beat the compiler where you can focus on a problem, but across a large application, the compiler will beat any human these days. So it's kind of interesting where our runtime is going. Is that sort of question going to happen in here? But there's some obvious questions to look at with managed runtimes. Say, so what's the footprint? It will require more memory to run a managed runtime because the managed runtime itself has to run in the background and there's a number of data structures to support that. But generally, we don't have a limitation on the amount of memory in our servers. We usually have way more memory than we need. Now, if you're on embedded devices and small memory constrained devices, managed runtimes are maybe not the issue. But let's face it, our mobile phones even these days have got many cores and quite a lot of memory. So here's an interesting one. Anybody been to Brisbane in Australia? So this is a very large interactive screen that can deal with different things. You can actually go over to the screen and stroke the water and get the fish and different things to interact. It can turn and do waterfalls. It can do all sorts of other things. It's many stories high. 
So this is real time. It's really interacting, much more complicated. Like, who writes web pages that require anywhere near the processing that this probably requires? And you sort of think, was this written in C or Assembler? Anybody have a guess what it was written in? JavaScript. Nah, it's actually not a bad guess, but something quite different. It's an experimental language called Impromptu. It's based upon Scheme, a bit like Lisp. And it's got some extensions. It's got a real-time garbage collector and really nice intrinsics for some of the graphics and DSP-style processing. And you can do things like this. It was designed for music, but you can do other really cool stuff. So it kind of shows you where some of this stuff's going. So kind of leave you with a parting thought. We don't have the infinite time. So where do you spend the time and sort of realize that sometimes our money's run times can let us save so much time to focus on the real problems. And the real problems are the algorithms. It's coming up with the good algorithms. Like if you went to Heinz's talk yesterday, you've probably seen how changing the algorithms mean much more than what the language features are because the costs are in the algorithms and the memory misses. And on that, I'll thank you very much and I've got a few minutes for questions. Do we have any questions, or is everybody full of pizza and tired? <laughs> I fault the JIT compiler can optimize. I fault that the JIT compiler can optimize the code and uh, actually inline uh, itself. Yes, that's what I was covering. So the JIT compiler can inline and optimize the code. The point that I was making was that. If you've got a static language like C or C++, it can inline, but you end up having a static decision not based upon the real code and the real data that you're running in production. The JIT does that based upon what's seen in production. So it's, it's doing it ahead of, or based upon the data, not ahead of time as a guess. No, it's not such a big issue. But the really interesting one on that is it can take time to work out where that code is. And where our JITs are going now at the moment is some of the latest JITs can store the profiling information of a previous run and then get a faster warm-ups. And if they're wrong, they can revert it and go back again. So it's moving in a nice direction. What is slowing down the Java version of Heron compared to the C++ version? So at the moment, one of the things that the C++ version can do that the Java version can't do is dealing with what are data-dependent loads and some bounds checking. So for example, we have a concept of a publication. Underneath that, it has a reusable structure of log buffers. We can't inline those log buffers with the publication because they end up having to be references. It would be nice if we could do a structure in a structure the way we can in C or C++ and manage that indirection. That indirection becomes a data-dependent load with the slowdown, and there's a few examples of that sort of thing. It's also things like Java is good at removing the bounds check if you're going to iterate over an array, but if you're just going to randomly go in and pick one reference in an array, it can't eliminate that. Whereas like, even though we know we can check that in advance, it can't do the, some of those sorts of things. Uh, the last post in the Mechanical Sympathy is uh, uh, somewhere 2014. Uh, I'm curious, what is the reason behind uh, this? The, the reason is that point that I was making, time. <laughs> I don't have the time. I, I have a backlog of about 40 posts I would love to write. I just need to find the time to do it. <laughs> I gotta make myself the time. I, I'm dyslexic, so writing is a real challenge for me. So it takes me like, to put the, a lot more time in even than most people do, but yeah, I must make the time to do it. Thank you. <laughs> and you mentioned you you mentioned you implemented uh, your uh, Aaron uh, framework also in Go. 
Mm -hmm. What was the performance of the Go version compared to the others? I, so the, the Go version was ported by a guy who works in the client. It's, it's kind of close, but it's still a bit behind, so Go doesn't optimize anywhere near as well. It's probably within about 30% at the moment, and we're making improvements all the time to the C++ and the Java, so it's kind of getting further away. The Go, the Go version is not getting as much time as the Java version or the C++. Thanks. Probably the last question, I have a few seconds. Okay, so uh, you mentioned you have a lot of friends doing game programming, and there it's really popular to use, like, uh, instead of arrays of structures where we have in Java structures of arrays. So mm -hmm. are there, like, uh, smart logic in the, the runtime which can do on compacting uh, rearrangement of uh, the memory layout in such a way so you can have this type of footprint? Yes, there is. There's some experimental stuff that's out there that will start to make some of that better if it, gets, if it actually goes through and makes it in, but it seems to be getting uh, limited attention. Value types start getting us towards that, so actually having proper tuples will help a lot. But it's kind of, I wish we will stop working on modules soon and start working on loads of the other backlog of stuff that's missing. It's like, I don't have a problem with modules, I have a problem with the lost opportunity of all of the other good things we could have had. <laughs> And that's it. We're out of time now, so thank you.